most of our time. Hi, everyone. Welcome um, on this lovely day. Um, and I'm going to hand for Becky to introduce herself. So I'm Becky Mulder. I'm a course for instructional designer um, from Penn Libraries. My name is Joe Schaffner, and I am a course for support librarian also from the Penn Libraries. So as you might have guessed from the title of our presentation, Scaling Blended Learning Penn's Teaching Plus Technology Program, we are going to cover five tips for scaling a blended learning initiative at your university. Uh, these include using an established framework, consider and model the student perspective, be organized, build a community of learners and inquiry, and then finally, iterate. So the, the, each of the tips will have an accompanying example from the Teaching Plus Technology Workshop Series. It's important to note that we're giving these examples not just to share some information from our experience, but also to illustrate the value of having some type of workshop or some type of programming um, that complements or supports this, this um, type of initiative at your institution. So before we get started with our um, content of the different um, tips, just wanted to say a few words about why the Penn Libraries in particular were were well positioned to support this type of initiative. Um, the quote here from our director, Kim Mackay, the director of Teaching, Research, and Learning, basically sums it up. We believe our campus community is best served by collab collaborations and workshops that focus on emerging and proven scholarly tools and methods. Libraries are especially well suited to be the hub for these activities. We work with all schools and centers on campus, and our focus is and continues to be the generation, distribution, and preservation of knowledge. Um, so the, the way that uh, Kim's vision sort of supports what we're trying to do with our blended learning initiative is that the centrality of the Penn Libraries, uh, coupled with the collaborative nature of our work, not just, we don't just work with other librarians and other faculty members, but also with pedagogical specialists, um, teaching and learning specialists, uh, folks in the Student Disability Services Office, et cetera. Um, Another important thing to mention here is that um, this wasn't an official mandate, and I believe this was actually mentioned at the, and during the last workshop about sort of who owns these types of initiatives. Um, well, in our case, there was no, no one told us to do this really. We kind of took it upon ourselves. Um, and we'll talk about sort of the benefits and perhaps maybe some of the limitations of that in a little bit. Um, but there is a, sort of an official statement that helped guide our, our, um, our initiative which is the 2015-2017 Penn Library Strategic Plan. So now we'll move on to our first tip, use an established framework. So in the 2015-2017 Strategic Plan, there was a section on goals for teaching and learning services at Penn Libraries, and there was this uh, subsection in that on digital pedagogy. And the de definition of digital pedagogy in the Strategic Plan are is uh, successful educational practices supported by technology. So that's fairly broad, right? Um, but based on the strategic plan, we understood that as staff in the Teaching, Research, and uh, Learning Services Directorate that we needed to do something in order to support this goal or to help achieve this goal. So our director, Kim, um, sought out uh, a framework to use to support the goal, um, and she decided on the New Media Consortium's Digital Fluency Initiative, um, which focused primarily on, on sort of the, the, the area of digital literacy broadly defined. From there, um, the, our, our directorate came up with a series of related um, um, fluencies, uh, six in total, and one of those happened to be digital pedagogy, and the others were also supported in the strategic plan. So once we developed um, these six different fluencies, each of these groups were turned into to workshop leading teams that were tasked with creating series to support these different fluencies. Um, so with the digital pedagogy group, we had a really fun time organizing that group because not only did we work with librarians, but we also worked with, with a bunch of colleagues from outside the libraries, and Becky's going to talk a little bit about that soon. Um, one of the things that we had to do, and again, this came up in the last presentation, was figure out definitions of digital pedagogy and blended learning. As you all know, these are, you know, they can vary from, from source to source. Um, but once we, we came up with that definition, um, with blend, and for blended learning, we decided on the purposeful use of a mix of technology and face-to-face -face instruction. Um, we came up with a three-part workshop series called Teaching Plus Technology, and each of these workshops were offered as a sequence. The first was just on blended learning as a concept and demonstrations of how it can be used. The second was called te um, um, Mixing It Up With Technology, which was all about actually taking a concept for a blended learning activity and applying technologies and exploring various technologies. 
And then finally, the, the third one was on active learning spaces. Uh, so both using um, rooms that are set up for active learning and also traditional classrooms to encourage um, active learning for that face-to-face -face element of, of blended learning. Sorry, what was the first one? It was just general blended learning. Um, it was just um, it More was, on the theory of blended learning? Yeah. So what what is it, again, because a lot of folks um, you know, there, there, again, there wasn't really, as I mentioned before, there wasn't like an official mandate for this type of initiative at Penn. So a lot of people were like, what's blended learning? <laughs> and in our circles, we understand that we kind of have a sense of what that means. We can point to a couple of official definitions, but because there was no official push, a lot of faculty were just unfamiliar with it unless they saw it to, to learn about it on themse uh, by themselves. So once we came up with these workshops, we identified uh, different types of workshop leaders, and Becky will talk a little bit about those soon. And then we created learning objectives for each workshop. So just a quick um, sort of um, couple tip, well, takeaways for this tip. Um, if you're thinking about a, using this type of approach at your institution, um, a really great first step is to identify some type of art, um, organizational motive that's articulated in an official document like a strategic plan. Uh, and it's also helpful to seek out uh, a framework from a professional organization like Educause, for example, um, that can then inform your approach to how you want to, to launch the initiative. Uh, we recommend uh, programming like workshops or other types of events to promote it. And then making sure that you have a clear understanding of the different types of learning objectives or just objectives in general for the programs, uh, programming that you will uh, implement. So the second tip um, is consider and model the student perspective. As I mentioned before, um, the concept of blending learning wasn't really well known at Penn, at least it wasn't widely discussed. So uh, in particular for the first workshop, it was important for um, all the attendees, and a lot of these folks were not just standing faculty, they were also adjuncts, TAs, um, uh, pedagogical and technical support staff, and even a few undergraduates were interested in this as well. Um, a lot of them weren't really very familiar with blended learning. So what we had to do was we actually had to model the blended learning experience for them in that very first workshop. So what we did was we went from the, the, the workshop leader attendee dynamic to a teacher-student dynamic, and we had them work through a series of tasks that demonstrated the various ways that technology and face-to-face -face instruction can facilitate blended learning. And we had them work through um, this um, assignment that Becky and our colleague Ed came up with, which was um, all about um, Bob Dylan and why he didn't accept the, uh, the, the Nobel Prize for poetry. Um, and sort of, so we had, we had the attendees do things like answer polls in class, uh, work on a, do a close reading on a Google Doc together in class, uh, things along those lines. So um, when you're doing this, when you're considering and modeling the student perspective, um, it's always important to remember to, to, to sort of introduce that concept to the attendees. Say, hey, we're going to role play here. And then make sure that you break the fourth, fourth wall when appropriate. Um, and this is especially true when there are things like there's confusion about <coughs> instructions, right? Because if these students are confused about the instructions, then it's likely that the actual students will be confused, right? So it's good feedback for you, good feedback for them. And also, if you run into any issues with technology, as we all know that happens inevitably, point that out and say, okay, prepare for this, build in time for this, anticipate this, come up with plan Bs, Cs, et cetera. Um, so the third tip is be organized. And this is a fairly straightforward um, tip. Um, but what we're saying here is make sure that you're organized in your, in your work with the various types of stakeholders who might be interested in this type of initiative. Um, the very first part of this tip is be clear about what you'll cover. Make sure that um, in all of your messaging and all of your promotional materials, you clearly state what the, what the program, what the event will be, and if it's a workshop or some other event where there are learning objectives, offer those in the programming. As we all know, it's always good to offer learning objectives at the beginning of every lesson, so as a sort of a roadmap, but um, we recommend doing that even before people attend so they understand this is what you're going to get out of this event. Um, also, uh, it's important to give yourself more time than you think you'll need. Uh, and this is especially true for segments of your event or workshop that are particularly important. One issue that we ran into with the second workshop, which is all about experimentation with, with technologies, a lot of the attendees didn't have enough time to try everything out. We wanted them to try out Zoom, Pull Everywhere, Yellow Dig, Piazza, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but we were only giving them 15 minutes. You can't do that, right? So we upped it to 40 minutes, um, and that seemed to work pretty well. And then finally, make sure that you communicate with attendees before and after the workshop. A good strategy is an email 24 hours before and after the workshop before, just to make sure everyone's on uh, clear about where they're supposed to go, to see if there are any questions after, to see if there are any follow-up questions. And if you anticipate having pre-work, um, we recommend contacting attendees one week before the workshop with instructions on how to complete the pre-work. And we did some of that as well with mixed results. Uh, sometimes people would complete the work, sometimes they wouldn't. It was never a requirement, it was always a suggestion. But we do believe that the people who did complete the pre-work benefited. So, that's tip three, be organized. 
welcome to tip four. Um, so we knew going into this set we really wanted to take advantage of the wealth of expertise, uh, <coughs> different uh, pedagogy schedules that we had across campus. So um, our founding team had, <coughs> it consisted of instructional designers, people who support courses either centrally across Penn, across all 12 different colleges, or um, more locally. So we had people who are uh, STEM learning specialists, um, staff who are uh, specialists in instructional technology and more classroom tech, uh, also people who have a lot of teaching experience. So um, out of the seven people here, uh, I think five have taught a college course um, and continually uh, teach courses. So that brought a lot of experience. Um, also people working in specific disciplines. Uh, so Ed was a member of the Penn Language Center. Um, Rashmi works with STEM. Uh, Kathy is Center for Teaching and Learning. So it brought a really great range of expertise. Um, and another great thing about this was that when we were doing outreach for workshops, um, we were able to invite participants from all across Penn. Um, and we really wanted to keep uh, the information we taught as specific as possible about using tools and different learning objectives, but as generic as possible when it came to uh, discipline-specific instruction. So we had people from the vet school, the nursing school, um, arts and sciences, the language center, just a full range of disciplines, uh, engineering, uh, nursing, and so they were, they were all grouped together in these workshops and we tried to make it as relevant as possible for everyone so that we will all get something out of that. Um, and then we encouraged a lot of time for sharing among the participants. Uh, some of the feedback we got later on said that as much as they loved the content that we taught them, um, the real value of the workshops was just being able to talk to other faculty and staff, uh, people who are doing different things, um, particularly in related disciplines, so the school of nursing and that people tend to hit it off and um, you know, how are you using pull everywhere in your course or um, even if it wasn't the specific tools we were generating, they had a lot of time to discuss and um, they were grouped in these big round tables so it just made for a very natural way to communicate to them. They really found a lot of great value in that. Uh, the last thing is to build a community of inquiry. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that is. Um, so this is kind of a, a term that was um, coined by Randy Garrison and Norman Vaughn, um, talking about how uh, the community of inquiry is shaped by purposeful, open, and disciplined, critical discourse and reflection, um, encourages free and open communication, shapes and tests meaning, and it's also dependent on um, sustained discourse. So having um, a lot of people sign up for all three workshops in a row, they got to see each other and um, have these ongoing discussions and build up on that. So that, they found a lot of value in that, um, just the open communication part. Last tip is to uh, iterate. Um, so we found, we've offered these this workshop series four times now, um, so there's three workshops. We've done a lot of experimenting, um, figuring out what we can reasonably do in 90 minutes uh, is <laughs> quite a challenge. Of wanting to have lots of discussion time and lots of time to work on these tools and then um, still make it a valuable experience for them. Um, so we were very specific about what we would cover um, in the workshop descriptions and in communicating with participants beforehand, um, just you can't do it all in 90 minutes, even um, over three different workshops. Um, we also anticipated needing more time. Always whenever there's technology involved, especially lots of tools in one workshop, it's always going to take longer. You're always going to have some glitch. Um, I'm actually surprised we haven't had a glitch yet. <laughs> yeah, so it's not over yet. <laughs> yeah, there's still time. Um, and so adding that extra time is really important. Uh, we got a lot of really great feedback by giving it a very short survey to participants at the end of each workshop, asking what they liked about it, what they didn't like, what they had expected to find by going to these workshops. Um, and overwhelmingly, they, they all wanted more specific examples of tools, so that was something we would incorporate into each uh, future version of the workshop. Um, they told us when there were things they didn't find so valuable, and so we cut those out, um, prioritized more important material for less important. 
Um, we also adjusted our workshops as uh, staff were changing in and out, and that gave us, uh, that diversity gave us a lot of um, good, good feedback to add into the workshops too. So we lost um, one staff member who was a just pedagogy specialist, um, and she had a lot of great ideas about um, using Bloom's technology, taxonomy uh, in blended learning. Um, and we, we got someone instead from the Penn Language Center who then uh, told us about task-based learning. And so that, um, we were able to, to switch up uh, the workshop instead. Um, and that was great because um, different faculty from different disciplines were able to um, learn different styles of learning. So nursing school, they use a lot of case studies, uh, whereas the language centers are using this task-based learning. Um, they were able to communicate and uh, share some ideas. And uh, one more thing about the uh, iterating, um, also be flexible about the course format and the different times that you schedule. We uh, experimented with offering the workshops at every different time of day and day of the week. Um, we had to think, um, think pretty quickly when uh, the Eagles won the Super Bowl. And, um, <laughs> that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> School was closed on the day that we were supposed to have our, our workshop, so you know, having a backup version online. Um, all things to be aware of. So if you, you know, are working for a school with a really great sports team, um, <laughs> and that might affect your changes. We are going to do questions at the end, but there's our email address uh, if you want to follow up later. We'll be here today and tomorrow.